Hello and welcome to this week's Journal Club. So this week we have three presenters um, who are going to talk to us about the Perceiver trial. So I'll hand you over to the, the presenters to get started on this um, trial. Thank you. Hi guys. Uh, so there are uh, three of us going to be presenting the trial today. So I'm Steve and then there's Augustine and, and Helen. Um, so I'm going to start us off and as you can already hopefully all see on your screen, um, we're talking about the procedure trial. So, oh, is that going to move? One second. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, we're going to, so I'm going to start us off with a bit of uh, background to the trial and then a bit of physiology of, um, of proning because hopefully that might be at least, might be a bit interesting things and I think Augustine is going to take over after me to talk about the methodology of the study and then Helen is going to finish us off with the results of the study, some conclusions and then we'll have a bit of a chat around uh, the study at the end. Is that moving on? Sorry. Hang on. What's down with what's next? Next I think. Hmm. It should be what There's an arrow. Ah sorry technology ungifted. There we go. So, um, so the Perceiver trial uh, essentially was created to answer this question. So does early application of prone positioning improve mortality in severe ARDS? Um, the Perceiver trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 and it was a multi-center prospective randomized controlled trial which involved um, about, 20, about 27 ITUs, most of them in France, one of them in Spain. And all of these centres had had uh, at least five years experience uh, with uh, proning patients prior to the onset of the study. So um, a bit of background to proning. So um, proning has been used for some time prior to this study being uh, undertaken. So it was used since the 1970s for patients with ARDS. Uh, it was used largely due to a lot of observational data out there showing that it basically worked. Um, and there had been uh, a number of relatively small scale trials done over the years that showed that uh, proning uh, people with ARDS uh, had an improvement in their oxygenation. But these trials hadn't really shown convincing evidence of improved patient outcome, which was then sort of the reason that Proceba was undertaken. Uh, to try and answer this question. So did actually proning not only improve oxygenation, but did actually improve their out patient outcomes uh, in the short and sort of long term. So um, the physiology of proning. So um, pr the physiology of proning sort of basically, uh, well, mostly revolves around three areas. So the uh, transpulmonary pressure, compression of um, the lungs by sort of thoracic and, ab and abdominal organs and then lung perfusion. So uh, the last two are kind of fairly self-evident as to what they, what we mean, what I mean but when I say that, but transpulmonary pressure, I'll explain just a little bit because we might not, not everyone listening may be immediately familiar with what that is. So um, transpulmonary pressure is uh, neatly summed up in the equation that it is um, alveolar pressure minus uh, intrapleural pressure. So it's essentially the difference in pressure between the inside of the alveoli and the pleural space. Um, and so if you can imagine by that simple equation, um, if you were to dramatically increase alveolar pressure, whilst keeping um, sort of pulmonary pre um, intrapleural pressure the same, the transpleural pressure would increase. Um, and that would therefore lead to distension of your, or increasing volume of your alveoli. Likewise, if you were to keep your alveolar pressure the same, but massively increase your intrapleural pressure, that would make the transpleural pressure smaller and therefore your um, alveoli would uh, reduce in size or collapse. Um, so with regard to the supine position, what we know is that with um, uh, transpulmonary pressure, there is a very large difference from the ventral aspect of a patient to the dorsal aspect uh, of their lungs. Um, and what we, what I mean by that is that in the ventral aspects of the lung, the alveoli are very distended, whereas in the, um, because the transpulmonary pressure 
is quite high, whereas in the dorsal aspects of the lung, the transformally pressure is quite low and therefore your alveoli are relatively compressed. And that's um, largely due to sort of the weight of the thoracic organs, the weight of the abdominal organs pressing on the dorsal aspect of the lungs, increasing that intrapleural pressure and therefore decreasing your transpulmonary pressure, which would therefore reduce the volume of the alveoli. Um, and in ARDS, this effect is accentuated further because not only have you got the weight of the heart and the lungs pressing down on the dorsal aspect of the lung, those lungs are now saturated with fluid. So you've got sort of horrible edematous lungs, which are sort of have a greater mass, I guess, pressing down on the dorsal aspects of the lung, which will therefore uh, decrease that transformative pressure further, leading to more collapse of those dorsal aspects than you would get normally. Um, you also get, well, as I've alluded, you also get compression of um, the dorsal aspects of the lungs by the heart. Um, which is sort of, uh, yeah, resting on the dorsal aspects, particularly of the uh, left lung. Um, and then also, if you think about the way that the diaphragm um, is anatomically, it, in the supine position, the abdominal organs are pressing down, particularly again on that dorsal aspect of the lung. Um, and so both of those sort of contribute together to, as, as I've mentioned, um, decrease the transformative pressure dorsally. Um, Perfusion is important in the supine position because it is um, known to be gravity dependent. So if you think the dorsal aspect of the lung um, is lower down, your blood is therefore more likely uh, to preferentially uh, perfuse the dorsal aspects of the lung. But as we've already, as I've sort of labored to death almost, <laughs> they, the dorsal aspects of the lung uh, are not well ventilated at all. So you've got the worst the air, uh, the air of the lung that is worst ventilated being most perfused and therefore you get uh, really significant um, VQ mismatching, uh, ventilation perfusion mismatching in that area. Um, however, in the prone position, things change a bit. So if you flip people onto their front, um, you reduce that ventral to dorsal transpulmonary pressure difference. And what that leads is to less over distension of your ventral alveoli and when we say ventral, we're now talking about um, ventral is always the, you know, the top part of the patient. So now obviously with the ventral alveoli are now the ones that were previously the dorsal alveoli. So these are now less over distended than the ventral alveoli were before. Um, and the dorsal alveoli um, are able to better um, uh, be better recruited. So they collapse less the dorsal aspects along when they do in the supine position. And this is partly because of uh, compression by organs. So now instead of the heart resting very much on the dorsal aspect of the left lung, it is instead resting on the sternum. And that takes quite a significant amount of weight off that area of the lung, which then enables the alveoli to expand more. Um, the diaphragm also does not impinge as much uh, on the thoracic cavity, and therefore again allows these alveoli, especially the dorsal aspects, to um, be better recruited and to expand more. Um, now you would think that in the prone position, if we said, if I, like I said previously, the, um, the dorsal aspects are preferentially perfused because of gravity, you would have thought that therefore perfusion wouldn't actually make, be much different in, in the prone position because it's still gonna per, perfuse the dorsal aspects of the lung, which though better ventilated than they were in the supine position are still not brilliantly ventilated in the prone position. Um, but actually what studies have shown is that in the prone position for various reasons, the, um, the dorsal aspects of the lung are actually, hang on, yeah, so that's sorry, yeah, so that's right. So the, um, yeah, so the dorsal aspects of the lung are actually still preferentially perfused in the prone position. So you, so sorry, the, try to get my words out properly. So the, on the prone, that's right. So in the prone position, the dorsal aspects are perfused preferentially, but when you flip them over, those areas which were in the dorsal aspect and now in the ventral aspect are still preferentially perfused, even though you would have thought that they, that the, the, um, the areas of the lung which are now dorsal would be. So it basically means that the areas that are now ventral, which are now being perfused much better, and ventilated, sorry, which have been ventilated much better, are now being perfused well as well. And so you get a much better um, uh, ventilation, perfusion, matching than you would do in the supine position. 
so to sort of hopefully explain for more visual people um i've just got a few graphs and stuff so in the uh, supine position this is sort of what your lungs look like so obviously at the top you've got your anterior uh, your anterior chest wall at the bottom you've got posterior so the top will be ventral the bottom will be dorsal and then to the right you've got your apex and the left you have your base so what these um sort of box charts show the clear um areas of the box graphs are um proportion of alveoli that are well ventilated the crossed hash hashed bits are um proportion of alveoli that are sort of moderately well ventilated and the completely blacked out bits are um, areas or uh, proportion of alveoli that are really poorly ventilated and as you can see those black boxes just get more and more um, significant as you get towards that sort of uh, the, more, the more dorsal and the more um, inferior you go. Um, this is quite a graph which I found quite helpful um, so at the top you've got um, the patient in the supine position with your um, transformative pressure there and the blood flow. So as you can see, the ventral alveoli are really over distended, the dorsal alveoli are, not, are unfortunately collapsed, and you've got really high transformative pressure, ventrally and really negative, and a really small one, sorry, uh, dorsally, and therefore you end up with these, with this over distension, this collapse. Whereas in the prone position, as you can see from the diagram, they're, uh, they're much more homogenous in, in how sort of distended or collapsed they are. Um, but the blood flow is still um, preferentially perfusing the area which is now much better ventilated and so you get a much better um, VQ matching. Uh, and the last one here I just again found quite useful um, to just explain why sort of the abdominal organs impact at all. So in the supine position you can see from the area from the slant of the diaphragm how it's pressing or you can you can see how the uh, abdominal organs would press on that dorsal aspect of the lung whereas in the supine position that's all moved out of the way so the abdominal organs are much more or just basically moving the diaphragm out uh, the pressure is move, allowing the diaphragm to move out of the way and therefore allow you to ventilate the patient better. Uh, so I think that's everything from me. So I'm going to hand over to Augustin. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Augustin and I will be talking about the technical aspects of the study. Now as you can see in this slide, I'm just going to summarize all the numbers in the big tree here. So, uh, like Steve said, it was a prospective multi-center randomized uh, trial. Uh, they had 27 ITUs and in total they had 51,000 patients. Uh, out of those 51,000, 3,500 had ARDS. And out of those 3,500, they only screened uh, roughly 1,500. We're not sure why the rest of them were not screened and uh, uh, taken into the study, probably because of manpower issues or technical issues. But out of those 1,500 that were screened for possible inclusion into the ARDS, ultimately only 466 patients entered into the study. And we'll go into why later. Now, the criteria to be included into the study is that the patient had to be intubated and mechanically ventilated for less than 36 hours, and the reason had to be severe ARDS. Now this less than 36 hours is a very important factor because they were trying to see if there's a mortality benefit if prone early. And also severe ARDS as defined by the PAO to FIO to ratio of less than 150 uh, millimeters of mercury, uh, it, they had to have, and this was with a PEEP of more, or, at least five and an FAO2 of 60%. So like I just want to emphasize early proning and it had to be severe ARDS. Now for the criteria for exclusion, this, is, this will be a couple of very uh, content heavy slides, but just to summarize, you couldn't go into the study if you had any of the contraindications for probe positioning. And this is actually a good revision of what are the contraindications for positioning like raised intracranial pressure, uh, facial trauma, tracheal surgery, pregnancy, any unstable spine, femur or pelvic fractures, or hypotension. They also had a couple of this uh, study specific things, like if they were prone before getting into the study, if uh, they used nitric oxide and alnitrin bismesylate before included into the study, if they were, if they were EOL, 
if the patient's family didn't agree, and things like that. If there were there was a lung transplantation, burns, or if they had more than 24 hours of NIV. So these are just some things that they were looking at, whether the patient can be eligible or not for the study. Now, so like I said, they screened 15,000 patients, but only 466 were ultimately eligible. And this is mostly because they utilized what they termed a stabilization period. So if they thought that the patient was eligible to be included into the study, they gave them 12 to 24 hours to either get better and not be in severe RDS anymore or to develop any of the contraindications. And I believe that out of those 1,500, a lot of the patients were not included because they got better after 12 to 24 hours. So ultimately, all they had was 466 patients. And if you look at other studies, this is actually an average number. Some patients, some studies had 80 patients, some had 800. So it's actually not bad in terms of uh, how many patients they had. Now, out of those 466, they divided them into two groups, obviously. So they had the supine group, which was just stay supine, and had the prone group. And these patients were prone uh, in the first hour after being randomized. And then they were in this prone position for 16 hours. Um, and after that, they would be unproned and then evaluated, do they need to be proned again? Now, what I found interesting is that it had this special clause, and Helen will elaborate on that later, but basically they had a rule which stated that if you were in the supine group and you had life-threatening hypoxemia, you would be transferred into the prone group to receive proning as a treatment option, which is a little weird if you look at that this is a study which is evaluating whether supine, whether proning is better than being supine. So just to point that out there, and Helen will elaborate later, just remember this fact that they had this special rule. Now, in terms of other protocols, it's actually a, a pretty good study because they had an appendix, and this appendix was bigger than the study paper itself. And in this appendix, they had lots of guidelines. So they standardized the way the patients were prone. They standardized how to react to, for example, desaturation while patient was mechanically ventilated. They standardized how to wean the patients and they standardized how to sedate and which neuromuscular blockers to use. Uh, they used cis atricurium for 48 hours at least and then up to clinician's um, opinion whether to continue. But this is very good to have all the patients basically following the same guidelines. So you were sure if anything additional you were doing that would, that would uh, show some benefit because of the additional stuff. Now, uh, this study defined how the patients would be mechanically ventilated. So they all used volume control mode. Uh, tidal volumes were aimed to 6 ml per kg. Uh, they had the PEEP level selected from the PEEP FIO table um, and they had to have PEEP at less than 30 centimeters of water. And they were aiming for a pH of the arterial uh, from 7.2 to 7.45. And this is also something you should remember later for the discussion, because not all studies had uh, protocolized mechanical ventilations that is basically today a standard of care for ARDS patients. So we, we will see later, um, uh, Helen will elaborate why this is very important to have a standard of care in the protocol for the study. Now, uh, for the supine group, they had that physiological variables measured every six hours. And for the prone group, they had four measurements. They had, and this I'm talking about the SOFA score, the ABGs, the FIO2 PO2 ratios, and things like that. So they had those measurements before being prone, one hour after prone, one uh, just before being turned to the back, and then after being returned to the supine position. So they would measure the PO2 FIO2 ratio for all of this uh, for. Um, situations and then they would make a graph and this is the graph that they would make and you can see well, the, well there's no legend but um, you can see all of the peaks are basically when patients were prone and all of the low points are when patients are supine so just looking at this one graph you can see that proning improved oxygenation but don't be carried away 
because we already knew from previous studies that proning improves oxygenation. What we wanted to know with this study is, along with oxygenation, does it improve mortality too? And I think this will be it for my, oh yeah, so the criteria for stopping prone treatment was if the patient was improved that he's no longer in severe RDS, if the patient deteriorated because of the proning or between two prones, or if any of the complications occurred like pneumothorax or facial trauma or eye trauma or hypotension or anything like that, then they would stop prone treatment. And just another thing additional that I wanted to note uh, about uh, this particular study is they had a protocol for desaturation where, where one of the points was um, using nitric oxide and almondtrio bismesylate as a measure for improving oxygenation, which is not something we see usually in treatment of ARDS. So I'll, um, so Helen will take over and discuss the results. Hi there, I'm Helen Vesey, and um, I'm going to be talking about the results section um, of the PRECEIVA trial, and we'll talk about the dis and we'll have a discussion as well at the end. Um, so results-wise, um, so the trial ran from January the first, two thousand and eight, to January the twenty fifth, twenty eleven, and as Augustine's already discussed, there were a total of three thousand three hundred forty nine patients with ARDS admitted to the ITUs involved in the trial, and um, there were. Uh, there was a quite a considerably lower number that fitted the criteria that were used in the analysis. Um, ventilator settings were similar in both groups. So they had a standardized ventilation setting that they used six mil per kilo of the predicted body weight, and they had a, a plateau pressure of less than 30. So that's quite specific to this trial. I think in previous trials, they had been using eight to 10 mil per kilo um, tidal volumes, which obviously has now been proven to be more detrimental for the patient. Um, the prone group, after they had been deemed suitable and then randomised, the aim was to prone them less than one hour after randomisation and the results suggested that most of them were done less than 55 minutes after randomisation. Um, on average, they had four sessions of proning and the average time that they were prone for was 17 hours. So the aim was 16, but the average time was roughly 17 hours, much like I suppose on our intensive care when you're trying to prone or supinate somebody at handover time, etc. Um, there were adjunctive treatments that were used as well, so neuromuscular blockade. They did list ECMO, vasopressors and antivirals as well, but they showed that there was no real statistical significant be significance between those two groups despite those things. So outcome-wise, the primary endpoint that they were looking at was the 28-day mortality. So in the prone group, the 28-day mortality was 16%, and in the supine group, it was 32.8%. Um, the this is obviously a, looking at the percentage-wise. This looks very significant, um, and that's what they wanted to show, I think, as well. Um, there were no increase in the number of adverse events in the prone group compared with the supine group. There were a higher incidence of cardiac arrest in the supine group. Secondary endpoints that they listed were 90-day mortality, successful ex extubation rate, and ventilation-free days. And they also listed intensive care length of stay, um, use of NIV post-extubation, um, tracheostomy rate, days free from organ dysfunction, ventilator settings, lung function, and arterial blood gases. The reason that I've put the top ones in bold was that these were more statistically significant than the ones below that are not um, put in bold print. So they um, adjusted the scores for um, the patient's SOFA scores as well. Um, but essentially the 28 day mortality numbers in the table show that, that the P value was very significant. So less than 0 0.001, as was the 90 day mortality. Um, successful extubation as well was also statistically significant with the prone group and the um, ventilation free days at ventilate days that they spent ventilation free at 28 days and at 90 days were all to also statistically significant so in summary the 
excluded patient data, this is something that they put in their discussion, was that the, a lot of the patients that were excluded from the trial at the different centres, their data was then not submitted to the researchers, so not all of their data was submitted to the researchers. So I think that that was their sort of clause for saying we can't actually say exactly why all of these patients were not included in the trial. But that is probably a bit of a discussion point because it would be useful to know exactly why the patients that potentially could have been eligible ended up not being eligible. Um, they didn't include fluid balance or catecholamines um, in the study. Um, and they didn't find any real statistical significance between the, the initial patient's SOFA score and whether they used vasopressors or any neuromuscular blockade usage. Um, and that statistically everything said that none of these things made any difference to, to the data interpretation. The other thing to take into account is that the centres that were used in this trial were very experienced at proning and Augustine mentioned that they all had greater than five years proning experience. And that's not, it's not really sort of categorised as to what they mean by that. I don't think it's been written down anywhere how they how they deem themselves to be experienced at proning. I don't know how many proning, prone patients they needed to do in order to then put themselves as being experienced. We had some thoughts about the trial. Um, and these are our thoughts, obviously. So <laughs> please don't shoot us and then obviously correct us if we're wrong too, but this is just things that we understood from the trial. Um, Previous trials that had been done before Perceiver had showed some improvement in patient oxygenation, but not overall mortality. Um, but that the ARDS patients who were prone early on did show some improved mortality. It was a bit confusing, really. I think part of the reason why a lot of the previous trials didn't show necessarily an improved overall mortality was that they didn't necessarily have set protocols before um, whilst they were doing the trial. So, they didn't have a set tidal volume that they had to fit to, for example. Um, the other thing that we were thinking is that the centres that were used in the trial had five years proning experience. So they therefore probably then knew that proning was a very viable treatment option. So it's whether that swayed any of the decision making. And I think Augustine made a really good point that their sort of get out clause of if a patient in the supine group became profoundly hypo, hypoxemic then they were swapped into the prone group which potentially I don't know if that skews the numbers a little bit because there's possible 17 patients. so it was only 17 patients so it wasn't a huge number but I think it probably does suggest that there is a bias towards proning being the, yeah. the successful th or the right thing to do whether that affected anybody's judgment regarding this the other thing we thought as well is that the trial ran for a couple of years. Did they carry on with it for that long in order to just sort of increase the power of the analysis of the trial? Could it have ended sooner if they, because they had quite, it was quite all statistically significant that proning did improve 28 day and 90 day mortality. Could they have stopped the trial earlier like they do with some other trials if they see a genuine benefit early on? but we, we were not sure whether it kind of needed to run for the length that it did in order to prove that it definitely does work. Um, we thought that the trial did have some good set protocols for caring for ARDS patients. Um, and we were just wondering sort of whether all of the things that they did is replicable for all hospitals. So I think it's something that we'd probably have to go through really as individual trusts and see whether it is possible to do everything that they managed to do with their proning procedures. But it does sound like that they had quite good protocols and were very used to doing it, which obviously is something that we should possibly aim and aspire to be like as well. Um, we're also interested in the fact that the proned and supine patients that were desaturating, they also or, uh, became hypoxemic. They also received nitrous oxide and Almitrin bismesylate, which is something that we don't routinely use here. So whether as a result of that, is their data replicable in RDGH? We don't know. Um, so we thought really that the, despite some of the things we've said about the trial, some of the questions we had about it, we thought that really the key take home message was that 
patients with um, se severe ARDS can benefit from prony treatments if it is utilised early and for relatively long sessions. Um, I think obviously we do our best now as well to make sure that when we prone a patient, we prone them for 16 hours. Um, it's then whether we prone them subsequently enough mm. and at the right time. And a lot of that I think is to do with experience of staff on the unit as well. Um, if we haven't got the experience level or the manpower on the unit, it, it's difficult to prone always or prone or unprone at specific set times. So that is something that is that can be a bit limiting.